Greetings to everyone who has joined. Um, this is Borodo Community Church, uh, part of Faith Ministries. We do run uh, these health uh, talks um, now and again in an effort to make and bring awareness to each and everyone, especially about the common ailments that we uh, suffer from, uh, specifically looking at um, and non-communicable diseases um, and some of the cancers that are quite uh, prevalent. So welcome uh, everyone who is uh, joining us um, for today's uh, talk. Um, and today I'm pleased uh, that we have one of our very own gurus in Zimbabwe uh, who will speak to us uh, on prostate um, cancer and men's health um, in, in general. Uh, and this is uh, Dr. Allen uh, Chiura. Uh, Dr. Allen, uh, greetings to you. Greetings, thank you for having me. Uh, just a little uh, preview uh, of uh, Dr. Allen, um, quite, quite a detailed one, but uh, uh, I, I, I hope I won't miss out on anything uh, because it's quite, it's quite detailed. It comes from far. Uh, but let me attempt to just go through. Um, uh, Dr. Alan Chura is a Zimbabwean-born urological surgeon who actually practiced in the United uh, States for 30 years. And he actually also did his undergraduate and graduated and worked at the American University in Washington, D.C., um, and then attended the Medical College of Pennsylvania for medical school. Uh, that was also followed by him specializing uh, in training in urology, uh, be beginning at Howard uh, University Hospital, and then completed at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital where he was then chief resident and finishing uh, in 1998. He then went into private practice in Delaware, Ohio, and uh, finally Oregon, where he was a clinical assistant professor. Um, and he then returned to Zimbabwe uh, in the year 2012 uh, to open his own practice uh, and also to facilitate the training of young urologists at um, Paririnya Atwa Government Hospital here in Zimbabwe. Uh, he is also a past president of the Alliance Frankes Board, past board member of Culture Fund of Zimbabwe, current board member of the National Sports and Recreation Commission of Zimbabwe, and he is also a board member of Pulse Pharmaceuticals Group and he is the member of the Medical and Dental Council's Education Liaison Committee, and is currently the treasurer of the Association of Urological Surgeons of Zimbabwe. Uh, and he is also a member of the Board of Trustees of Bauk um, uh, School. Uh, quite a mouthful, uh, Doc, there. Uh, and together with uh, his wife, uh, Dr. Nozipo Maraire, they are co-presidents of the Discoverum the first and only children's museum uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, talk, doc, Dr. Chura. Thank you, thank you very much. Again, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Faith Ministries for having me here and uh, to really congratulate Faith Ministries for taking the time and putting in the effort to educate the populace on these common ailments that we see uh, uh, quite frequently. Uh, thank you, Doc. So the um, nature of our talk uh, today, uh, it will take um, uh, the following format where uh, Mr. Chura uh, in the medical field will refer to surgeons as Mr. Uh, but for this, uh, for this forum, I will mix Mr. and Doc so that you don't necessarily that think, don't think that you are just hearing or listening to an ordinary Mr. Someone. So I will, I will be mixing up the two, but as a medical profession, I'm more inclined to be calling him Mr., uh, but I will mix it up for the sake of the general audience. Uh, so he will um, uh, give us a brief talk 
uh, on um, uh, men's health and touching a number of uh, issues that pertain to, uh, to men. If you do have a question, um, please um, post it on the chat. Uh, we will then have a time of questions and answers after his brief, brief talk. So I will uh, give you this opportunity, uh, Mr. Chura, uh, for, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much again for that introduction. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, uh, November, or in the rest of the world, uh, where it is known as Movember, with an M, um, is Men's Health Month. And um, this year, we'd really like to try and educate as many people as we can on the issues that are afflicting men. Um, we have a, a, a slogan that we're using uh, at, uh, at Ecosurgica, where I work, uh, saying, uh, families for men's health. Um, most of the time when I see men in my practice, it's because there's a loved one, usually a wife, that brings that gentleman into the office. So a lot of times, even though I talk to men's groups, it's oftentimes the wives that I'm actually speaking to because they're the ones that actually bring these men in. So <clears throat> in the month of November, worldwide, one of the things that we do to bring awareness to men's health is we actually all grow mustaches. Mustaches can be either beautiful or they can be quite ugly. And on me, they're generally very, very ugly. So in this month of November, my wife has to put up with what sort of looks like a mustache, but it's all to bring awareness to men's health. There are essentially four issues that I'd like to bring up in this Men's Health Month. The first one is prostate cancer, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The second one is what we call benign prostatic enlargement which is by far the more common problem. The third one is testicular cancer, purely because it is lumped together with prostate cancer by the, by the cancer associations. But in all fairness, testicular cancer makes up a very, very small percentage of all the cancers that we deal with. But I will touch on it. The more important one that is actually not talked about very much, which is actually a crisis, is men's health. There's actually a men's health crisis globally. Suicide rates amongst men are very high. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I do see a fair amount of depression within men, and I think it's time for us to address this, acknowledge that this is existing, and actually find uh, therapy and, and, and find physicians that can help us deal with it. So going back to the prostate cancer, prostate cancer is the most common cause of death amongst men, is the most common cause of cancer death amongst men here in Zimbabwe. And worldwide, I believe it's the second commonest cause for death amongst men. So it is a common condition. And there are some people that will say, if you live long enough, you will probably get cancer of the prostate. And there's, there's, there's some truth to that. And so in terms of its aggressiveness, prostate cancer on the, on the, scale, of prostate, on the, on the scale of all cancers is actually a relatively slow growing cancer. But the problem with it is that there are cases in which prostate cancer is diagnosed and can rapidly lead to someone's demise. So for us here in Zimbabwe, where we see a lot of it, particularly in the government sector, it is important that we get the word out that men get checked and screened. The fundamental problem we have in men is that unlike women who are introduced to the healthcare system very, very early, once they reach um, sort of uh, menopause, they're starting, to, not menopause, <laughs> once they reach um, their, their time of having puberty, they start entering the healthcare system where they are seeing their doctors. And so they're used to being seen by doctors, whereas us men, once we get out of that pediatric age, we actually don't even go see the doctor until we wait for one thing. And there's usually one thing that drives men to the doctor, and that is pain. The fundamental problem with waiting for pain is that there almost is not a single cancer that occurs that has its first symptom being pain. By the time pain arises, most of these cancers are already spread, and so you're showing up to us with cancers that are already spread, and now we're not in a position to actually cure them. 
So we need to get rid of the mindset that something has to feel wrong, I have to be in pain, I have to feel sick in order to go to the doctor. So if we can get into the idea of going to the doctor on a yearly basis, just to get a health screen, to be checked out once a year, beginning at age 40, go to the doctor, get checked, and we will be able to pick up a lot more diseases earlier on, manage them and treat them. I won't even get into the, the more common ones like diabetes and high blood pressure. Yeah. And those could also be picked up much earlier if we could. So, um, that's the, so just now delving into the prostate cancer issue. So the only way that we can pick up these cancers early if we do two things. There are two simple things that we do to screen for prostate cancer. The first is we'll do a simple blood test called a PSA, which stands for prostate-specific antigen. PSA is a, is, is, a, is a protein that is found in the, prote in the prostate, and people will say, so what does the prostate actually do? And it's a really good question. The only time we actually need our prostates is when we're having children. It produces a fluid that protects the sperm in the process of trying to have a child. Once we are past that, that stage of our lives of having children, we no longer need the prostate. And so if honestly the prostate sat on the end of our fingers here, we'd all walk around with a digit that was a little short because we'd just chop it off. Unfortunately, where the prostate is located is deep within the pelvis. It's very difficult to get to. And so we unfortunately can't just remove it. But that's the only time we need it. And so the screenings that we do are a PSA blood test and then a simple exam called a rectal exam. The rectal exam is very good for picking up any nodularities or abnormalities in the prostate, but it also it gives us an opportunity to screen for cancers of the rectum, which can also be picked up. So that's a simple thing that you can do once a year and we would pick up so many more cancers earlier and be able to cure them much, much earlier. So that's how we screen for prostate cancer. So who should be screened? We know that the majority of patients that develop prostate cancer are generally older, typically over the age of 60. But what we've noticed is that, particularly in this country, we are seeing patients present with prostate cancer much younger. So beginning at age 40, we recommend that we start getting screened. The, the patients who have a family history, in other words, if your father, your grandfather, your brother, your uncle, on your father's side, if there's any, anyone in those that has had prostate cancer, those patients put you at risk for prostate cancer. And the closer the relative is to you, the higher the risk to you. So if your brother had prostate cancer, that risk can be up to four times in yourself. So you really need to be sure that you know your family history so you know who's at risk and if you are at a significant mm -hmm. risk for this disease. So I've talked about prostate cancer in general. I've talked about how we, we screen for it. Now, people will ask, what are the symptoms of prostate cancer? And this is the problem. There are no symptoms. I repeat, there are no symptoms of early prostate cancer. And early prostate cancer feels absolutely normal, and which is why they are the hardest patients when we see them in the office and I'm telling them, I've, I've diagnosed you with prostate cancer because they look at me and say, but I feel fine. The problem is there are no symptoms. When people say, um, I'm having trouble going to the toilet, I'm going to the bathroom frequently, you know, uh, I can't seem to get to the toilet on time, all of those symptoms have nothing to do with prostate cancer. Those symptoms are actually more to do with benign prostatic enlargement, which is by far the, more, the most common condition. Benign prostatic enlargement is just an enlargement of the prostate that all men will undergo as we get older. And so it's not uncommon that when we were in our 30s, we didn't get up at night at all to urinate. But now some of us uh, getting up there in age will oftentimes have to get up maybe once a night and as we get older, two, three, four times a night. And all that has to do with just an enlargement of the prostate. So remember, prostate cancer has no symptoms. Benign prostatic enlargement has all of those symptoms. And so prostate cancer typically only has symptoms once the cancer is already out of the prostate. And typically, prostate cancer goes to what we call these lymph nodes that are in the pelvis, and then it goes to the bones. 
And it can go to any of the bones in the body. So it's not uncommon that if you, people will come in and complain of hip pain, they'll complain of shoulder pain, and that actually may be an indication that the cancer has already spread to those parts. So if I can give you a take home message, the one is please get screened. The second is there are no symptoms for prostate cancer. So please don't wait for any symptoms and get checked first. If we do pick up a prostate cancer early enough, we divide the treatment into two. One is early stage, where it's confined to the prostate. We can do surgery to remove the prostate. We can do radiotherapy to actually cure the disease. Once it's already outside of the prostate, now we are stuck with only one option, which is what we call hormonal treatment, which doesn't cure, it palliates, meaning that it'll allow us to keep the patient alive as long as possible and as pain-free as possible but it is not curative. So the earlier you can get picked up, the more likely you can be cured. Moving on to benign prostatic enlargement, as I've already mentioned, this is the enlargement of the prostate that we're all gonna undergo as men, and that's the one that is associated with the symptoms I described. Typically, frequency, urgency, straining to urinate, getting up at night more often, the flow is slow. All of those things are very, very common as we get older. If you like to have a beer every now and again, do you remember when you could have a beer and you could sit there still talking to your friends for another couple of hours? Now you have a beer, and after that beer, 20 minutes later, you've got to go to the toilet. That's all because of prostatic enlargement. And that means that it's time to go get checked so that you can actually get treated early before that disease causes even further damage. Because what typically happens is we get to a point where we are completely unable to urinate. Now we call that urinary retention. The problem with that is that that can cause damage to the kidneys as well. And sometimes that damage to the kidneys is irreversible. So don't allow these symptoms to go on for too long. Please go in and, get, and seek treatment. Moving on to testicular cancer. As I mentioned, testicular cancer is not very common. But testicular cancer has no pain. There's no pain associated with testicular cancer. It's a mass that you can feel in the testicle. So typically my recommendation is once our young men turn 16, once a month in the shower or in the bathtub, they should feel their testicles. And if they feel anything hard, they should report that to their doctor because that is abnormal. And again, please do not be embarrassed. It's not uncommon that these young boys won't come to us with small masses. They will wait and wait and wait. And by the time they come in, they're coming with huge masses. And so the sooner you come in, the better it is and the quicker we can get a cure. Now, one of the nice things is this, is that testicular cancer, of all cancers, is probably the most treatable. It responds very well to surgery and it responds very well to chemotherapy. And it also responds very well to radiotherapy. So it is a very, very treatable cancer. There are two age groups that typically get testicular cancer. It, there's an age group that typically is around 16 years of age up to about 35. And then we have another group in their 60s to 70s that also get it. And the symptoms and the presentation is the same. On to the last bit, and again, I'm not, I preface, I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist. I come to this purely because I'm an advocate for men's health. And we are seeing suicide rates in men that are very, very high. We're seeing depression rates that are very, very high. I can only encourage our men to please seek help. We have far more help than we've ever had. There are, there are, a, lot, there are a lot of counselors now available. There are a lot of psychologists available. There are a lot of psychiatrists available. Please let us seek help for these conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chura. Uh, for that uh, profound talk. I know that as a medical practitioner, you have to really tried to simplify it as much as possible for us to be able to understand um, and the general uh, public to understand and appreciate issues that pertain to, mental, uh, to men's health um, and specifically prostate cancer, testicular cancer, and in general, uh, men's health. Um, we would want to open this time uh, to questions. 
Um, and as I attempt to look through the questions that uh, you might have posted, um, maybe just uh, one from me, uh, a few from me, um, Doc. I think it was quite scary when you mentioned that for when we look at uh, prostate cancer, there is no pain. And it's usually pain that drives us to seek help, but it's not there. You also said that there, are, there may not be any symptoms. Uh, again, scary, because that should that drive us to seek help. So um, I just wanted you to emphasize one, one more time the importance of screening. We don't need to wait for symptoms. Yeah, so um, the, the word screening really pertains to looking for and trying to pick up disease within a population that may actually have no symptoms. And so that's really what it is that we're trying to do. We're trying to get these cancers detected early enough so that we can affect a cure on these patients so we don't affect the, the lifespan of these patients. Um, I work at Parreña to a hospital um, and I can tell you that in any given clinic, we see probably three, if not four, patients that are coming in for the first time uh, in any given week. And invariably, all four of these patients will have come in because either they can no longer walk or they're coming in because they have pain that is debilitating. And it's all because they've got cancer of the prostate that is already spread. So, again, I cannot stress the importance of screening, simple, really simple, just a simple blood test, a simple rectal exam, and we're only asking you to do it once a year. It'll take, what, 10 minutes of your time, but yet could save your life. So please do take the time to do it. So there's another aspect, again, Doc, that you mentioned, that um, when you look at maybe risk for one to get cancer, sometimes you need to look through whether any of your relatives got affected by, one of the, by any of those conditions. But it's, it's uncommon, neither is it our culture, uh, to share what has caused one to pass on uh, what shall we do, uh, educators, maybe as uh, the current generation, uh, so that maybe those that are uh, behind us uh, or after us will then know what would have taken our lives or what we would have suffered from? Yeah, no, that's a very, you know, this is a very, very important point that you raise, and um, it's one we have to grapple with quite often. But what's mm -hmm. interesting is that we have a we have a generation that is now asking questions. And um, this generation is now taking care of their parents. And so they are the ones that are actually bringing their parents in for care. And so because they are the ones that are bringing their parents in for care, they will actually know what the diagnosis is. Unlike in times past, uh, when we did not know what our grandparents died of, neither did they knew, know what their parents died of. So I think we are becoming far more aware um, as, a, as a society. And I think it's becoming less taboo to talk about our health issues. Um, and again, because, because our families are no longer so separated as we were before, if you remember, you know, we had people living, a lot of, a lot of people living in the villages, and, and, and we have these same older people now living in town. They no longer live in the, in, in the village like, like it used to be. So they're in town. So because they're in town, their children are in communication with them, their children are taking them to the doctor, and therefore their children know what the actual conditions are. And so I think, I think as time goes on, we will know more and more about our family history. And we're becoming more and more astute to actually ask what it is that, what are the ailments, even as far as medications. A lot of times I'll ask you know, an elderly man that comes to see me, but oftentimes he comes with his grandchild. I'll say, what medicines is he taking? And it's the grandchild that actually is the one that's telling me what the medicines are. So I think uh, we will move on with that. Uh, thank you, uh, Doc. Uh, some, some of the questions that have come through. Is it possible to have 
Um, is it possible to have prostate cancer without having had an enlarged prostate? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, the answer is yes. Um, in fact, I would venture to say that most patients that we diagnosed with prostate cancer actually do not necessarily have enlarged prostates. So the two are not necessarily connected. Um, a lot that, and that's the problem, and that's why those prostate cancer patients don't have symptoms, because they don't have enlarged prostates. And so we're picking up prostate cancer in patients who have no symptoms. Uh, thank you, Ms. Dura. Another question, is there anything that one can do to prevent or slow onset of this, of this cancer? In other words, are there any... Pre preventions that one can do to prevent the onset of the cancer or even slow it down? So, um, I believe the, the, the estimate is something like 58% of all prostate cancer has some sort of a genetic component. And so, that's why knowing our family history is really, really important. So that's one. You try and figure out what your family history is. Now, in terms of prevention, um, there are so many things that have been studied to figure out are there any dietary things that you can do to prevent prostate cancer, uh, exercise, smoking, drinking, all of these have been studied. And the only one that seems to have stuck is that there seems to be a predilection for prostate cancer in patients that have had high fat diets. But if you look across the board in terms of cancers in general, you'll probably find that patients who have high-fat diets are at risk for almost all cancers. So high-fat diets is probably the, the one that, that sticks with, uh, with us the most. So what can you do? Make sure you have a well-balanced diet that is rich in fruits and vegetables. Um, there is one study that actually has shown that patients who have uh, a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, they tend to have a lower risk of getting aggressive prostate cancer. It doesn't really tend to affect the, the, the low-grade cancers, but when there's aggressive cancer, those patients tend to do better. Um, exercise has been shown to, again, similarly, it doesn't seem to affect patients who are getting low-grade cancers, but in patients who get high-grade cancers, those who have been exercising on a regular basis don't seem to be at risk for it as much. And so those are the things that have been shown, that have been proven. Now, um, I received a, a WhatsApp message today that I listened to, and it's being broadcast very, very widely. And this one is claiming that if you use lemons and... Uh, and you, 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 you boil it with water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reality is that for all those that are listening, um, there is no proven scientific basis behind that. So for all the claims that are out there, they do not hold any water. Um, we had tomatoes for a while. Everyone was eating tomatoes, saying that they will prevent my prostate cancer. Now, there was a, there was a, there was a scientific basis to that one. But the reality is that the studies that have been done have actually not held out that actually tomatoes do not really prevent prostate cancer. I hope it's coming out loud and clear um, and addressing some of these questions. Uh, there's another question, uh, Doc. Um, one is asking the cost that is involved uh, for the medical personnel to conduct the prostate cancer screening. What yeah. sort of costs are we looking at? Are they prohibitive? Are they affordable? Are they minimal? So um, I don't know what the cost of a regular visit to a GP is because remember, um, and I, need, I, think, I think I need to stress this, the screenings that I'm talking about are not, and I repeat, are not necessarily done by a specialist. These are things that your, your general practitioner will do for you. So in, in your yearly visit, when you see your general practitioner, a PSA will cost 
maybe about $20 or so. Nice. And um, the digital rectal exam is part of your exam. So whatever the cost is to see the GP, plus the $20 for the PSA, that's probably the total cost. Which we can put as minimal, it's compa minimal. compared to the condition that you then end up with. Absolutely. Uh, getting to an advanced stage just because you hesitated or you avoided uh, screening. Uh, so I think let's, let's get uh, to have that habit of screening. Another one asked a uh, doc saying that if someone gets an ultrasound scan of the prostate, it's done, it comes out normal, no abnormalities found, is it possible to still have prostate cancer? That, that's a very, very good question and, uh, and one that's still hotly debated. Um, we have a lot of uh, general practitioners that send patients for ultrasounds instead of doing rectal exams. The reality is that we still pick up prostate cancers with a rectal exam. And not to say that you shouldn't send patients for an ultrasound scan, but provided that the rectal exam is normal, um, the PSA is normal, you can be reassured that that patient is probably okay. Now, ultrasound can and has the ability to detect some cancers that we on exam cannot. And so that's particularly where it becomes very helpful. So if we have a patient that has a normal PSA, they have a normal rectal exam, but on ultrasound they may have a lesion that is being seen to be what we call hypervascular, meaning that that cancer tends to have a lot of blood vessel. I mean, that, that nodule in the prostate tends to have a lot of uh, uh, blood vessels. We may advocate for a biopsy in that particular case. But the, the, to have a normal ultrasound does not necessarily mean that you do not have prostate cancer. Thank you, Doc. So if I hear you right, a full examination is necessary. Absolutely. So go through the wall, full exam, which comprises of the digital rectal uh, exam, then the prostate-specific antigen PSA, and then your ultrasound scan. If you have all those being negative, then you, you may derive comfort from it. Absolutely. So I think let's be encouraged to go through the whole uh, full range of And, and if I could just add, so um, the normal, if you look at a, a normal reference range on a laboratory slip in terms of what is a normal PSA, uh, a normal PSA on a reference range will tell you it's less than 4.0. Um, however, that really depends on the age of the patient. And so we have what we call age-specific PSAs, which can get up as high as 6.5, depending on the age of the patient. Um, there are patients who will have a PSA. I've had a patient who had a nodule on, a, on his examination, and his PSA was 1. Mm -hmm. So you need both. Both are important. Uh, the other questions that are coming through, uh, Doc, again, is that um, if, uh, if one goes through um, surgery uh, for prostate cancer, um, how, how does one minimize or prevent um, erectile dysfunction after prostate surgery? Yeah. Um, again, that's a, that's a very, very good question. And it goes back to uh, early detection. So the nerves that go to the penis that allow for, for, for an erection, those nerves run right along the side of the prostate. And so if we get these patients early enough, these nerves are not affected. And so when we do the surgery, we can do what's called a nerve-sparing prostatectomy, where we're able to actually leave those nerves behind. And by leaving those nerves behind, these patients can maintain their erections. The difficulty we face is that because patients come so late, the tumors have encroached on the nerves. And so it doesn't make cancer sense to remove the prostate and leave those nerves behind. So in those particular cases, it's very, very difficult. And we have to take those nerves with them rendering most of these patients unable to have erections on their own. 
Now, having said that, it's not uncommon because these are nerves and nerves are not a single fiber. They're usually a branch. Mm -hmm. And just because you take the nerves that are close to the prostate, it's not uncommon. And I've had patients who have done this to me before where I will tell them immediately after the op, I say, listen, we took your prostate out and the nerves looked like they were involved, so we took the nerves. So I don't think you're going to be able to have erections anymore. Two years later, while we're following up these patients, they come in and say, Doc, just so you know, I'm having erections now and I'm having satisfactory sex. So it's not always 100%. We know where the nerves are, but they are branching. And so there may be enough branches and nerves can regrow. And so sometimes in time, they may recover. That's one. Two, we now have pills that we can give, we have injections that we can give, and the worst case scenario, we can actually do surgery to put prostheses in that can help people continue to have satisfactory intercourse. Uh, thank you, Doc. Um, I hope everyone is hearing and also the person that have uh, uh, posted that question. But maybe just to add to say, if indeed you one head uh, surgery and you are having post-surgical complications, uh, please uh, go back to, 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 to the surgeon so that they can re-examine and assess and even advise what, what, what can be done. Uh, so don't just derive comfort in just to, um, watching. Uh, so please uh, be encouraged to seek further help. As you have heard from uh, Dr. Chiwara, he is saying that there, are, there is help that can be done. Um, so let's please seek for that help. Again, um, another question that is coming is that if one is diagnosed with uh, an enlarged prostate um, and the urologist recommends uh, TURP, I think this is a, a medical person that is asking <laughs> TURP. Let me simplify it and say um, a surgical operation on the prostate. Does it reduce or eliminate cancer risk? Yeah. Um, again, another good question, but um, the, 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 I'm going to make the assumption that a, a proper examination has been done, the PSA has been assessed, and that the rectal exam has been done, and that there's nothing to suggest that this patient has prostate cancer. The TURP will have no effect on whether or not you have prostate cancer. Um, have, if you have benign prostatic enlargement, you have benign prostatic enlargement. Now, having said that, in about 10% of patients that we take to surgery for the procedure that he's describing, which is the procedure where we go in, we go in through the penis with a telescope and we essentially shave the prostate. It's imagine if you have an apple and you have the, the core of the apple is the urethra and the pulp of the apple is the prostate that's squeezing the urethra. If we were to go in there and shave the pulp so that we create a nice cavity for these patients to urinate through. That is the procedure that he's describing. In 10% of, 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 of cases where we go and do this operation, the histology will come back with prostate cancer. Because remember, prostate cancer has no symptoms. But these patients came in for symptoms of benign prostatic enlargement, and we just so happened to find prostate cancer. So again, I think um, let's still go through uh, the screening process. So just because someone had the TURP done, it does not necessarily mean that one will not have the cancer. That is true. Um, uh, thank you, um, uh, Dr. Chura. Um, I think another question also that um, has come is on the aspect of awareness. Uh, so this one is saying we have a lot of awareness and free screening campaigns for women. Um, it's also time for us to advocate for men's health, uh, especially rural folk who may need, who, who may not have medical aid. Um, 
So I think coming from the angle where I think quite a number of programs now are availing free screening for women's conditions, but we are not seeing that uh, for the men. Maybe it's because we don't talk enough. Yeah, I think you know that's our fault. I think that's completely our fault as men. Um, these are things that we have not talked about, and uh, I can assure you that uh, as a urological association, this is something that we would like to address. Um, we would like to campaign with the the same people that are doing the, the screenings for women um, should not leave us behind and we should campaign aggressively that we get the same screenings for our men so that they can be taken care of uh, in a similar fashion. Uh, thank you. Another question coming through. Uh, this one is saying, why does it seem uh, like prostate cancer has been on the rise over the years? It's actually on the increase. Why, why, why is it so? What's driving that? So, you know, that's a, it's a difficult question to answer because the reality is that I don't think, and I, I can even just compare, I came back to Zimbabwe 10 years ago, and I can tell you that 10 years ago we were doing nowhere near the amount of screening that we're doing now. So I think what we're seeing in terms of the rise is just the awareness that is now percolating through the community and through the society to get screened. And so because more people are getting screened, we're detecting more cancers. I think that's really what the, what the, what the cause of the increased rise is. Uh, thank you, and I think it's very true. Uh, in the past, you just used to hear that your security has passed, but you wouldn't know what is Yeah, passed. you'd hear something like he died of bone cancer. Yeah, you see. Yeah, yeah. and when in actuality that bone cancer was a prostate cancer that spread to the bones. Yeah, true. Um, then this one is also asking about urinary incontin incontinence after surgery. Uh, he's saying, uh, can, can you please say something about urinary incontinence? How long does it last after surgery? Mm -hmm. um, urinary incontinence is probably the most difficult problem we have when it comes to prostate cancer surgery because it's a, it's a reality. Um, um, I think the, the, the studies will go up to even 50% of patients will have some degree of incontinence after prostate cancer surgery. And I'm not talking about TURP or the, the, the procedure that we were describing earlier. This is truly where complete removal of the prostate uh, is done. Um, the, the difficulty is that the sphincter, which is the muscle that allows us to control our urine, is very, very close in proximity to the prostate. So when you remove the prostate, the, 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 the muscle fibers can get damaged in the process of removing that prostate. The, there is no real predictable way of saying who is going to get incontinence and how long they're going to have it for. But the, the, the more you can leave a long urethra, mm -hmm. the, more, the less likely they're going to have incontinence. And there has been a, a massive improvement in the technique that we are using now for radical prostatectomy compared to years gone by. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, we do not have the ability or luxury to do what's called robotic prostatectomy. So for those that can afford it, we send them down to South Africa for robotic prostatectomy. And that's when they do exactly the same procedure. But because they're using telescopes, to enter the abdomen and actually be able to see where they're removing the prostate a little better than we can with an open procedure. They can, they can actually do what's called an anastomosis where they actually suture the urethra and the bladder together a little better than we can. Um, and so their rates are maybe a little better than ours. But the reality is that most people can't afford to do that. So we have stuck with the, with the original way that we have to do it. And, um, all I can say is that um, we do the best we can to try and minimize the incontinence. And, and oftentimes this incontinence is not what we call total incontinence, where you have absolutely no control of your urine. That isn't quite the incontinence that you get. The incontinence that most of these patients get is what's called stress incontinence. And that's where when you cough or you sneeze, then you may get some leakage. But with physical therapy, a lot of times we can get these patients to where they're dry. I think you are mentioning something that is quite interesting there, Doc. 
uh, where you are saying robotic surgery can actually be better. Uh, but I wanted just to say, what does it take for us to have that in our own country? Because, <laughs> yes, we may, we may drive down to South Africa, those that I can afford, what do we need to do as a country to have that in our own country? What does it take? I think, um, like, like, like everything, honestly, um, it takes uh, the will um, to, to, to fund healthcare the way it really needs to be funded so that our hospitals are well equipped, uh, the medicines are available, and, and then we can maybe start looking at things like robotics. Um, but it's very difficult to advocate for things like robotics when we're struggling to get some basic medicines in, in some of our hospitals. But that's what it would take. Uh, thank you, Doc. Another question again that, is come, that came is that um, are there any other ways of treating uh, prostate cancer other than surgery? Yeah. So, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 we divide you know, the, the staging of prostate cancer into clinically localized prostate cancer, meaning that the cancer is still confined to the prostate. It hasn't gotten out yet. And for those patients, depending on how aggressive the disease is. And so when we do a biopsy, what the histology tells us, it tells us one, that there's prostate cancer, but two, it also tells us how aggressive is this prostate cancer. And there's something that's called a Gleason score that we use to tell us about the aggressiveness of the disease. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the age of the patient, depending on what medical conditions or other medical conditions the patient has, we can look at, this, at, the, at the grade of this prostate cancer. And if it's a relatively low grade, one of the treatments we have, which is not really a treatment, is what's called watchful waiting. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to treat everybody that has prostate cancer. There are some people who have a low grade tumor that we will watch. We will just check their PSA every three months. And as long as that PSA stays about the same, we don't do anything. Because there's a chance that that patient will die of some other condition before they ever die of prostate cancer. So they don't need to undergo treatment for something that, they was not, that was not going to kill them. Then the second two are surgery, like we mentioned, and the, and the other one, which is equally good, is radiotherapy. And radiotherapy can be done in two ways. We have radiotherapy that is delivered from the outside by what's called external beam radiotherapy. And then the second option is what's called brachytherapy, where we actually instill small little radioactive pellets into the prostate that deliver prostate that deliver radiation from the inside. And the unfortunate bit is we do not have brachytherapy available to us here in Zimbabwe yet. Hopefully it is on its way. Thank you very much, Doc. Uh, another interesting one coming through. Uh, do you recommend use of herbs? for treatment of prostate cancer? Uh, or in other words, are there any help or supplements one can use? So, um, the most commonly used drug, and I'm going to call it a drug, I'm not going to call it a supplement, because the, the natural food people tend to call these things supplements when they're actually a drug. The most commonly used drug in the world for any prostate condition is a drug called sol palmetto. And if you were to go into the pharmacy and you go into where they have all those men's health prostate supplement bottles and you were to lift up every single bottle and to look at the ingredients, almost every single one of them would have sol, sol palmetto as an ingredient. And so, and the reality is that the studies that have been done on sol palmetto particularly for enlarged prostate, have shown that in a third of the patients, it will actually decrease the size of the prostate. And in a third of the patients, they actually continue to have an increase in the size of the prostate. And in a third of the patients, it made no difference at all. So if it's working for you, continue to take it. <laughs> if it's not doing anything for you, you're probably not doing yourself much of a favor by taking it. And they call it an herbal supplement, but the reality is that it's actually a medication, and it's, 
a similar medication. It has a similar effect to a medication that we call finasteride, which is a drug that you get from the pharmacy. Now, all of those drugs, what they do is they'll decrease the prostate size by about 30%. They will decrease the PSA by about 50%. But please do not think that they do anything to stop prostate cancer. Thank you. There you are. Uh, another interesting one, Doc. Uh, is it true that having a lot of sex often prevents prostate enlargement, probably preventing prostate cancer also? Uh, it doesn't matter what forum I'm in, this question always comes up. And um, so the studies um, that were originally done um, were suggested that people who actually have more sex have a higher increase in prostate cancer. But that has proven to be incorrect. There are some studies now that do suggest that, and it's not necessarily about having sex, it's about the number of ejaculates. The idea is to get the ejaculate out of the prostate. And so the more ejaculates you have, the less chance of you getting prostate cancer. I have not seen any studies to suggest the same for enlargement of the prostate though. I have only seen the ones relative to prostate cancer. So in simple terms, <laughs> Doc, are you agree because the ejaculates are more increased when you have, when you have the sex? I, I, I agree, uh, but there are people who masturbate. So in other words, you can look at people who live in monasteries or people who decide to seclude themselves for a long time and you would think that those people would have a higher risk of prostate cancer but that may not necessarily be the case uh, thank you so much doc i think i've gone uh, through most of the questions that came through uh, but i think at this juncture uh, doc uh, may i maybe just ask you to give us highlights um, of this talk um, just in a few minutes, the take-home message uh, yeah, that thank we may you. need to have. Um, take-home message is, uh, it's the month of November. Please uh, grow a mustache. Uh, and have people laugh at you and ask you why you're growing a mustache and explain to them that you are raising awareness for prostate cancer and men's health. Um, probably second most important take-home message is that uh, we need to be screened. Uh, prostate cancer has no symptoms. Please don't wait for pain. Don't wait to feel ill. There are no symptoms. The third one is if we can get these diseases picked up early, and, and now I'm going to go beyond prostate cancer. It doesn't matter whether it's breast cancer, whether it's colon cancer, whether it's bladder cancer. We need to pick these cancers up early, and they don't cause pain. So please get screened, get checked, have an annual on your birthday, just say, on my birthday every year, I'm gonna to go to the doctor and just get checked. Make that a habit. Um, and then the last one, and again, I'm gonna highlight it again, please do not ignore men's health. Our men's health is, is really, really important. I can't recall what the statistic was, but when we lose the father of a household, there's almost a 50% chance that that family is going to go into poverty. So please, families, be for men's health and let's take care of our men. Uh, thank you, Doc. Just in case there is anyone amongst us and anyone who might have at least sent uh, to this talk, if they need direct help, uh, how, how, how can they be helped, uh, Doc? The best and first, the first and probably the best way to get help is to see your GP. Go to your GP, tell your GP that you really would like to get screened, and the GP will screen you. If, if, if you really want to be seen by a urologist, we now, thank goodness, have at least 13 or so urologists in the country. So, and we have urologists in Bulueo, we have urologists in Gueru, we have urologists in Arare, and hopefully soon we'll have urologists in some of the other cities. But we're now growing as a, as a specialty, and so we'll hopefully be, become more and more available to the general population. But uh, 
the things I'm talking about do not necessarily need urology help. These are things that you can do for yourself with your general practitioner. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doc. So um, if I'm also to reiterate, I think the message that is coming all over and over again, it's screening. When we are talking about cancer, Dr. Chura emphasized and mentioned in most instances, no pain. So don't wait for any symptom, any pain. Let's go for the screening. Um, let's not ignore, but let's start it now. From what age, Doc? Starting at age 40. Yeah. Starting from age 40, let's get screened. Um, let's not wait for any pain, any symptom, but let's get um, screened. Thank you very much. Uh, we have been having Dr. Chiura, uh, a urologist um, in our midst, in our country. Thank you for coming back from all the way, United States, uh, to come and look after your own. Um, and thank you for this talk. We cherish that much. We don't take it for granted. The time that you have taken out of your busy schedule we really value the time that you have given us. Um, most of us, we have consulted today for free, <laughs> for zero. <laughs> so we really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Chura. No, for... thank you. Thank you very much. And again, and thank you so much for all the health education that the church is doing. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Tinashe Magumise, signing off together with Dr. Chura. Thank you very much.